Okay, so today's lecture is about bainite, and we'll do exactly what we did with martensite. We will begin by looking at the characteristics of bainite, and then try to explain them quantitatively. And from what you learned today, we should be able to design some really good steels in the following lecture next week, okay? So everything that I'm going to tell you today is quite important if you want to design bainitic steels. Okay, so once again, we are looking at transformation between austenite, which has a face-centered cubic, but it's a closed pack structure, so we often call it cubic closed packed, into a body-centered cubic crystal structure. There's no difference in the allotropic transition. It's still going from face-centered cubic to body-centered cubic, but bainite forms at a higher temperature than martensite, so I explained to you that things get a little bit confused because it's possible for some atoms to be mobile at the higher temperatures. Now, I explained to you that there are two classes of phase transformations, uh, the reconstructive transformations and the displacive transformations. I'm going to explain that once again. So imagine that we have our austenite and it has two kinds of atoms in it. The round atoms and the square atoms. So that, that could be, for example, manganese and iron. And we want to change this unit cell from this shape to a shape which looks like this. Okay? So that's our phase transformation. We've changed the unit cell. We can do it in two different ways. The first is very simple, that we homogeneously deform this so that we create the correct pattern. Okay, so here we have austenite, and this is a new crystal structure of ferrite. And since we have achieved this change in crystal structure by a physical deformation, uh, there is no diffusion involved. So here, for example, this atom has this neighbor in the product phase, and it has the same neighbor in the parent phase. So we call that an atomic correspondence. There's an atomic correspondence between the parent and the product phases. This atom knows where it came from in the parent phase. And that is why we get a shape memory effect with displacive transformations, because we are just recreating the arrangement of atom without losing uh, neighbors. Furthermore, if you look at this, the chemical composition of this region is exactly identical to that region, the corresponding region in the parent phase. But the most important thing to notice here is that given that we change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged, the overall shape has also changed. Yeah. And that is the macroscopic shape deformation which we call an invariant plane strain, right? It leaves this plane undistorted and unrotated on a macroscopic scale, but it's also very large because if this is surrounded by other crystals, then it's going to cause a lot of strain energy. So these are strain energy dominated transformations. Now imagine that I first transform by a homogeneous deformation, that means a displacive mechanism. I then take this corner, cut it off, and translate it onto this side. Okay? That is effectively diffusion. Okay? I'm cutting off this corner, translating it onto this side. So that's diffusion and it's happening because strain energy is a bad thing. You know, it, it raises the uh, energy of the transformation product. So if I do a displacive transformation and also diffusion, then I achieve what's known as reconstructive transformation because we do not get a shape deformation apart from volume change. Okay? So this is exactly like when a glass of water solidifies into ice you do not get a change in shape apart from the volume change, right? There's a lot of fluid flow which prevents the formation of large strains. Now, obviously, if you have fluid flow going on in the form of diffusion, then if the square atoms prefer to be in one phase than the other, then they will partition. Partition means you will end up with more 
of the square atoms in one side compared with the parent phase. So here, look, we've got a larger concentration of square atoms than we started off with because the square atoms want to be in the product phase in this case. So there will be a composition change because diffusion allows the system to approach equilibrium better than a displacive transformation. But there is no macroscopic shape change apart from volume change, and that volume change will be isotropic, not just normal to the habit plane as we did in the last lecture. Right? Is everyone happy about the difference between these two? You can imagine that a reconstructive transformation happens like a displacive transformation, but you have to transport matter in order to avoid the buildup of strains. Okay? So these are obviously closer to equilibrium, but they require atomic mobility. So they happen at relatively low temperatures. And the problem with bainite, you know, the reason why uh, in the past few decades there, have be, there has been a lot of discussion about how bainite forms is because it's forming at a temperature where there is a possibility of diffusion. Okay? Uh, now, a lot of the discussion is qualitative. If you look at the literature, you know, it's not really proving things quantitatively. And what I want you to focus on is the quantitative details, because then you can actually make a prediction that you can verify experimentally. But if you just discuss like politicians, you know, that if I do this, this will happen. There, there's no real proof in that. The proof of a theory comes when you make a prediction, which is not known, okay? And then you do an experiment to validate it. So I want to go through that process for the Bainite transformation, and at the end of that, to see whether we can make predictions. So once again, stop me if you have any questions. Now, this is a classical time temperature transformation diagram. And I've got this, uh, this is experimental, uh, where we have iron 0.4 weight percent carbon, and here we have iron 0.4 weight percent carbon and two weight percent manganese. And I'd like you to focus on this for the moment, the iron manganese carbon phase diagram. It's divided into two C curves here. And this is, of course, representing the martensite start temperature. The C curve, which is at higher temperatures, represents reconstructive transformations, for example, uh, allotromorphic ferrite, perlite, and so on. And this represents transformations where we get a shape deformation, which is an invariant plane strain with a large shear component. So it's displacive transformation. And of course, martensite is also a displacive transformation. Now, the problem is that when we reduce the alloying elements in our steel, everything becomes very fast. Look at the time scale over here. This is uh, one second here. So when you try to measure a curve like this, you do not pick them up as separate curves because they're just happening too fast compared with your dilatometry, etc. But you will find that there is a retardation of transformation here corresponding to this break in the two C curves. Now, can anyone explain why, uh, remembering this is a, a logarithmic scale here, why does manganese have a smaller effect on displacive transformations compared with reconstructive transformations? Any ideas? You know, this is, this is several orders of magnitude change in the kinetics compared with approximately one order of magnitude change when I've added two weight percent of manganese. What is, uh, let me ask the question in a different way. What is the role of alloying elements? How do they work? It doesn't just apply to manganese, but everything that we add to steel. Yeah, correct. Hardenability means, you're absolutely right. What does hardenability mean? No, 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 not, not deformation. Hardenability means the ability to harden the steel. So if you can cool it slowly and still get martensite, that has a high hardenability. And if you can cool it, if you have to cool very rapidly to get martensite, then that has a low hardenability. So in this case, for example, to get 
Martin said I had to have to cool really fast. Yeah? So that's a low hardenability. And here I can cool relatively slowly. So that's a high hardenability. But I still want to know how does manganese influence the hardenability? Yeah. Any ideas what alloying elements do? Very good. So if the elements have partition between the phases, then they have to diffuse, right? And diffusion can be slow. So how does that explain the difference between reconstructive and displacive? Yeah? Yeah, there isn't diffusion with displacive, so the effect is going to be much smaller. But there is an effect. So where does that come from? You know, even the displacive transformation is influenced by manganese. So how does manganese influence if it's not diffusing? Yeah, so diffusion is a kinetic effect. Does that give you a clue? Is there another effect? Yeah, thermodynamic, yeah? So if it influences the relative stabilities of the austenite and ferrite, that means the difference in free energy between austenite and ferrite, that will have an effect on all transformations. Yeah? So manganese will retard all transformations because it reduces the free energy change between austenite and ferrite. Okay, so this is, this is quite important uh, when designing steels. Uh, there are two effects of alloying additions. So here goes, I'm going to try this. There are two. That's quite all right. And effects of solutes. Solute is the same as alloying addition. Okay. The the first one is in influencing delta G, um, delta G gamma to alpha. Okay. The driving force for phase transformation. The relative stability of austenite and ferrite, and all, all transformations influenced. Influenced. And the second one is diffusion. And diffusion is only happening with the reconstructive transformations. And therefore, there will be a much bigger effect of solutes on reconstructive transformations. So it's only relevant for reconstructive transformations. Okay, so let's, let's carry on with um, understanding the time temperature transformation diagram. So if your reaction is happening rapidly because there aren't enough solutes, then you may not pick up this split between the two curves because there will be an overlap of information. And generally speaking, this split is at approximately 600 degrees centigrade, because it's at that sort of a temperature that substitutional solutes and even iron become mobile. Okay, so the difference between reconstructive and displacive transformations is pretty close to 600 degrees centigrade. That's why when you want to secondary harden a steel, because secondary hardening requires uh, things like molybdenum carbide and so on to precipitate, that cannot happen at 400 degrees centigrade. You've got to temper your steel at about five or six hundred degrees centigrade to get substitutional solutes to move. Now, we can actually calculate these diagrams, okay? So you can just download the software for doing calculations of TTT diagrams from uh, our website. Put in whatever alloying elements you want, and it will predict the relative shifts 
in the two sets of C curves. There is, of course, more detail. And the upper C curve here represents, for example, the formation of allotromorphic ferrite. I will talk about allotromorphic ferrite later. It's the ferrite which starts at the austenite grain boundaries uh, and perlite as well. And then we have the Weidmannstatten ferrite here, what's known as upper bainite, lower bainite, and martensite. I'm going to go through all of these during these 12 lectures, but today we are going to focus just on the bainite reaction here. Okay, so what is uh, bainite? Um, there has been some translation of notation from, <laughs> from Macintosh to Microsoft. Uh, this is 0.2 micrometers here, this symbol. Does that represent micrometers in Korean or not? <laughs> okay. So this is to give you an idea of the scale of the microstructure. This is 0 0.2, the plate of bainitic ferrite is 0 0.2 micrometers thick typically and is about 10 micrometers in length. Okay. Now, immediately that tells you that optical microscopy is not good enough to resolve bainite. Yeah? What is the resolution of an optical microscope? It's actually bigger than that because the wavelength of light is 500 nanometers. Yeah? So to get any resolution below about 500 nanometers is tricky. Yeah? So there's no way that you can just use optical microscopy to resolve the structure of bainite. To see what I've drawn over here, you need uh, either you know, uh, a good scanning electron microscope or preferably transmission electron microscopy, conventional transmission electron microscopy, nothing fancy. So upper bainite is, uh, forms at a relatively high temperature and we have plates of ferrite which are completely free from cementite precipitates but there's a lot of cementite in between the plates of ferrite. And in the case of lower bainite, you have some precipitation inside the plates of ferrite and a smaller amount of precipitation between the plates. Okay? So these are classical microstructures, extremely well established. If you transform at a relatively low temperature, you will get a structure which looks like this. If you transform at a relatively high temperature, you will get what's known as upper bainite. And whatever theory you have, you've got to be able to explain this, okay? You've got to be able to explain this quantitatively. When will we get lower bainite? When will we get upper bainite? And why is it important? This is a very bad microstructure because here we are not tempering, we are not controlling the precipitation of cementite. The cementite actually forms during the course of transformation. So they tend to be very big particles of cementite and that ruins the toughness if you are working on high strength steels. And that's why, you know, if you look at structural steels, they will have low carbon concentrations if they are accelerated cooled. Yeah, to generate bainitic microstructures, they will always have carbon, usually less than 0.058%, okay, if you are doing accelerated cooling. Uh, the strength comes from the very fine scale here. You cannot achieve a quarter micrometer grain size by thermomechanical processing or in the normal way. Here, you just achieve it by phase transformation. But this is a bad phase. In fact, lower bainite is stronger than upper bainite because it forms at a lower temperature. And yet, it is tougher than upper bainite because all these particles are finer. Okay? So, if you have a higher carbon concentration, then it's better to have lower bainite than upper bainite. Okay. We haven't actually explained how these structures are generated, but these are the facts we know about the microstructure property relationships. Okay. Here is an actual uh, micrograph, and notice the scale over here. This is uh, one micrometer, so the plates are typically uh, about 0 0.2 micrometers in thickness and there is this phase in between the plates uh, which can be cementite. This is simply the rest of the martensite. It's been partially transformed. Yeah, one of the problems with uh, steels such as line pipe steels and the literature on line pipe steels 
is that people call it a name. They call the microstructure a name. But what they are really looking at is material which has been transformed over a range of temperatures. Okay? And therefore, uh, all the particles have grown and touched each other, and their shape no longer represents the shape during growth. So if you want to look at the mechanism of transformation, you've got to look at partial transformation. That means you form some, some transformation product, and then you quench it. So this is Martinsite in this case. If I fully transform this, and particularly if it's uh, like a composition of line pipe steel where the carbon concentration is very low, then all the grains will grow, touch, and change their shape because they have to fill space. So people just give it a name. They call it a circular ferrite or whatever without understanding how these crystals form. So this is uh, the upper bainite, where you can see that inside the plates, there are no carbide precipitates. Okay? In contrast, this is lower bainite, where in addition to the cementite in between the plates, again, look at the scale. This is half a micrometer. Uh, in addition to the precipitation between the plates, which is on a finer scale, you have some of the carbon precipitated inside the plates of ferrite. Okay, so this is a very characteristic way of distinguishing between upper and lower bainite. In lower bainite, you also get cementite precipitation inside the plates. And the scale of the carbides is smaller. And that's why lower bainite tends to be tougher than upper bainite, even though it is stronger. Yeah. Normally, when you increase the strength, the toughness decreases, right? Yeah. Do you understand why? Why do you expect, uh, you know, in general, I'm talking in general, why do you expect the strength, uh, the toughness to decrease if the strength increases? So supposing I look at the flow stress of iron, okay? because you get a tough material if it is able to flow plastically, even though it's strong, yeah? because plastic flow absorbs a lot of energy. So if I plot uh, the, see I've been practicing. Okay, so I'm plotting here the temperature and here the stress then the reason why we get a ductile brittle transition in iron is that the flow stress of BCC iron is very sensitive to temperature, okay? because it's a, it's a relatively open structure. Yeah, ferrite is a relatively open structure, so the piles barrier to dislocation motion is large. So the variation, oops, its flow stress is very sensitive to temperature. Okay? Now, if I plot on this the cleavage stress, that means the stress to break the crystal without much plastic deformation, yeah? that doesn't absorb energy. That's what we call brittle fracture. If I plot on this the cleavage stress, then the cleavage stress is pretty insensitive to temperature. Okay? So that means that below this temperature, I have cleavage. So in this region, I have cleavage, and in this region, I have ductile failure. Okay, so this is brittle and ductile. And the transition is, of course, the ductile brittle transition temperature. Now, can you see what will happen if I increase the strength? If I increase the strength, uh, so let me just label this. This is for plastic flow. And this is for cleavage. If I increase the strength, okay, so stronger, then you can see that the ductile brittle transition temperature increases. Okay? And the material will behave in a brittle way over a bigger temperature range. So what we see between upper and lower bainite contradicts this because 
when we have lower bainite, it's stronger, but it's still tougher because the carbide particle size is smaller. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Now, this is a beautiful technique uh, which allows you to look at the shape in three dimensions. Okay? So we are looking at two different surfaces at the same time. And of course, this, uh, you know, the, if you look at the scale, this is using optical microscopy. But nowadays, you can do this on a very fine scale, right? Do you know of a technique by which you could do this? Very easily and on a very high resolution, looking at two surfaces at the same time? If I asked you to prepare a sample which is only one micrometer big, but you're looking at two surfaces, how would you do it? Some of you may already have used this technique. How would you machine a sample which is only one micrometer by one micrometer by one micrometer? We have the equipment here. Yeah? Focused iron beam. Yeah? Uh, have you heard of that? So you just use a beam of ions to cut out a sample and then you can look at it. Uh, normally, we use it for look, making thin foil specimens, but you can do the same technique here. And the importance of this, so this is again uh, bainite, and it's partially transformed to uh, bainite. So this is bainite, this is all martensite. Uh, you can see that the bainite is plate-shaped in three dimensions. Okay? So it's not a needle, it's not acicular. Acicular means needle-like. Needle-like is like this. It's a plate in three dimensions. Can you tell me why the bainite etches darker than martensite? Yeah, so this is a very good way of distinguishing bainite from martensite in a specimen which contains both, even using optical microscopy. Why does the bainite etch darker? Yeah, go, go on. Uh, carbides. Yeah. So this is, this is untempered martensite. So there aren't many interfaces to attack with a chemical. But this contains structure in the form of carbides and so on. Yeah. Therefore, an agent will attack it more. And you can recognize optically the difference between bainite and martensite if you have both of them in your structure. Okay? Obviously, if it's fully transformed, you can't tell the difference optically, but you can see the contrast is pretty spectacular. Yeah? Now, the next characteristics, the characteristic that we need to look at when we are forming uh, a, a picture of the atomic mechanism is whether the transformation produces a shape change or not. Okay? A shape change beyond a volume change. And I told you that you know, the scale of a bainite plate is about 0 0.2 micrometers in thickness. Right? So we cannot use the interference techniques that I showed you for martensite to look at the surface relief caused by the plates. Yeah, we have to use another technique which does the same job. So this is a, a, a crystal of austenite, which is polished completely flat. And then it's allowed to transform into bainite. And then we look at it in an atomic force microscope okay? or a scanning tunneling microscope. So basically, those are techniques to look at surface topology on a very high resolution. Yeah, you can get to atomic resolution but you can get quantitative information about the surface topology. Um, these are individual platelets of bainite, and you can see that there is a very large shear deformation here, okay, just like in martensite. But there's one more thing I want you to notice. This is the adjacent austenite here, and that has relaxed. 
Can you see that? Yeah, you remember in the last lecture, I talked about plastic relaxation of the shape deformation. How's that? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. So um, if we have an elastically accommodated uh, shape change, then you will get a perfect tilting of the surface. And this is the martensite under the surface. Okay, So this is alpha, and this is gamma, and gamma. And this is elastically accommodated. But this is quite a large deformation. If you are at a high temperature where the austenite is mechanically weak, then it will tend to relax okay, by plastic deformation. So instead, you get a shape deformation, which is nice and clean where the plate is, but then, uh, oops, then you get a, a rough relaxation. Okay? And here we have the plate of alpha, gamma, and gamma. And this is plasticity. And this has a very major consequence on the structure of bainite. You remember we said that the transformation interface has to be glissile. That means the, you know, the dislocations in the interface must be able to move without diffusion. Right? If you put obstacles in the way, of those dislocations, then the interface cannot move. Okay? Those obstacles can be precipitates, they can be dislocation tangles, and so on. So the plate of bainite simply stops growing, even though it has not hit anything else. When this plastic accommodation builds up sufficiently, the plate of bainite which is growing simply stops growing. That means you get very, very fine plates, much finer than with martensitic transformation. So that's a good thing from the point of view of structure property relationships. And I'll show you a transmission electron micrograph of the structure at the interface between bainite and martensite, uh, bainite and austenite. So this is the diagram that I just drew out, where we are looking at plastic accommodation in the adjacent austenite. And of course, one more thing, which is very important, is that if the bainite grows into this region, then there will be a large orientation gradient within the bainite because its dislocations produce misorientation. Right? So this is a transmission electron micrograph of that interface where this is austenite and this is the bainitic ferrite. Look at the, look at the dislocation structure in the adjacent austenite. Huge numbers of dislocations by the relaxation of that shape change. And those basically kill the movement of this interface. So bainite plate forms, and even before it hits any obstacle, it just kills itself and stops growing. Okay. Again, an optical micrograph, and these are our uh, plates of bainite, and this is the martensite. And I'm going to show you now uh, that this black color is produced not just by the carbide particles, but there is actually these things consist of thousands of small plates, each of which has grown to a certain length, length stopped, and then you form newer plates. So this is not actually a single plate, but it is a cluster of thousands of small plates. So I'll show you a transmission electron micrograph which shows one of these objects. So the scale here is 50 micrometers, and we are now looking at a scale which is um, one micrometer. Okay? So one of these objects is this. This is a montage. The important thing is that each of these plates grows to a certain size at which plastic accommodation stops its growth. And then you can only propagate transformation by forming a new plate. Okay? So these, the plate length over here is the same as the plate length over here. 
So they're all growing to a finite size because of this plastic accommodation. And that's very, very good for mechanical properties because you cannot get such a fine structure even with mitosite. If this was elastically accommodated, then this would be a single plate. So we call this cluster of plates a sheaf of bainite. A sheaf uh, is just a collection. You know, just like when you harvest wheat, yeah? You don't hold individual strands, but you tie them up into a cluster, which is called a sheaf of wheat. This is a sheaf of bainite, S-H-E-A-F. Everyone happy so far? Now, let's look at whether uh, the atoms move during transformation. And we previously discussed an atomic method of doing chemical analysis. Yeah. Uh, it's the atom probe, where you, know, you pull out atoms one by one, and you measure the time of flight between two points. And from that, you can tell what kind of an atom is. And you can even collect only specific kinds of atoms, say carbon or silicon, and form an image of the distribution of those atoms. Okay? So here is one of the earliest um, proofs of the partitioning of alloying elements during the bainite transformation. So this is called a field ion micro uh, image, where we are looking at individual atoms. And on this side, we have austenite. This side, we have ferrite. Distribution of iron, distribution of silicon. You can see there is no partitioning of silicon. You can, of course, these are images, but you have quantitative data to prove that. Okay. But look at carbon, right? Carbon seems to have partitioned into the austenite. Yeah, when, we, when we do the measurement, carbon distribution is not uniform. The ferrite contains little carbon compared with the austenite. Okay. So we might reach the conclusion that during the bainite transformation, the carbon diffuses, right? But let's think about that a little bit more. Let's, let's think about how long it takes carbon to diffuse at the temperatures of interest. So one hypothesis is that carbon diffuses during the course of transformation. But we could also have a scenario like this, where bainite forms exactly like martensite. There's a carbon supersaturated plate. Okay? But at the temperatures where we are making our observations, the carbon then escapes into the austenite. And at high temperatures, it escapes rapidly, so you get precipitation between the plates. As you lower the transformation temperature, here we have a plate of martensite. The carbon is escaping, but at the same time, there is an opportunity to precipitate. Yeah, because the driving force for precipitation inside ferrite is also large, just like tempering of martensite. So given that you precipitate some carbon here, you will have less carbon in between the plates. So such a, such a theory would explain easily the difference between upper and bainite. But we need to prove that the initial growth event is like martensite. Okay? So let's, let's calculate how long it takes for the carbon to escape from a plate of martensite at the temperatures where bainite forms. Here is a, a calculation. And you know this is a, a typical temperature range over which you might get bainite. And this is the time required for all the carbon inside the plate of martensite to escape. In, fa in fact, uh, the, the quench and partitioning process is similar to this theory, where you are taking martensite, heating it up so that the carbon escapes from that. So the times are of the order of seconds or less than a second. That means that by the time you do an experiment to measure the carbon, it will have moved, right? So by measuring the carbon concentration, you cannot prove that at first, the transformation is diffusionless. By the time you go to make a measurement, things will have changed. Right? So it looks really hopeless, doesn't it? How can we prove the role of carbon if we cannot examine it fresh? This is one of the reasons why there has been a lot of controversy. Okay? So I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, you remember this uh, diagram. 
where in the top half we are plotting the free energy curves of ferrite and austenite okay, at a particular temperature T1. And to get equilibrium, we draw this common tangent, and that gives us the A3 and the A1 phase boundaries when I plot these points as a function of temperature. Right? That's the way thermocalc and empty data and so on calculate phase diagrams. But this is an interesting point where ferrite and austenite of the same composition have identical free energy, yeah, the green point here. And diffusionless growth is only possible if the austenite composition is less than indicated by that green point, because then we have a reduction in free energy. But on this side, it's impossible because you increase the free energy if austenite transforms to ferrite without a composition change. Yeah, is everybody clear about that? This is a very, very important diagram from the point of view of designing steel. So if you are not clear, this is your opportunity. Okay. So if I plot the locus of these points as a function of temperature, I get what's known as the T0 curve. Diffusionless transformation is impossible here. And it's possible in principle if the austenite has a carbon concentration less than the T0 curve. Okay. So now we are going to do uh, an experiment in our head a thought experiment. Now, supposing um, so we're plotting carbon concentration here and the temperature. And let's assume that we have an alloy uh, with this carbon concentration, which I'll label as X bar, okay, average carbon concentration of the steel. And this is the T0 curve. And we also have the A3 curve, which gives us the equilibrium carbon concentration of the austenite. OK, now I'm going to take my steel and transform it to bainite at this temperature. So I'll form a plate of bainite here, just like martensite. But the carbon can escape because it's a high temperature. Okay. Oops. So the next plate of bainite will form from austenite, which is richer in carbon. Here. Okay. And that will also partition carbon. And this process can only continue until the point where the austenite composition hits the T0 boundary. It cannot happen once the concentration of carbon in the austenite reaches the T0 boundary. Okay. On the other hand, if we have partitioning of carbon during the growth of bainite, then I don't even need to form uh, the uh, form the bainite below the T0 temperature, these plates simply continue growing until the composition of the austenite reaches the A3 curve. So if we measure the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops, then we can determine whether the carbon, uh, whether the bainite formed like martensite or whether carbon partitioning happened during the growth of bainite. So I'll illustrate that once more. Right, so if it is the case that bainite forms like martensite, but the carbon then escapes, then the reaction would stop at the T0 curve. Okay? This dashed on the T0 simply represents uh, a calculation where you take account of strain energy. Okay? But if carbon partitions during the growth of bainite, then you can see it's a big difference. Okay? These are real calculations, and the difference between this concentration and this is very large. So if I show you some experimental results, 
Okay, so the dashed on the curve is simply to take account of the strain energy because when bainite forms, we have a shape deformation. This is a real, real measurement of the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops. And you can see this is a very large difference. This is an atomic uh, fraction, okay? So multiply by 20 to get the weight percent. So the difference here and here is very large. So this proves that when bainite forms, it forms exactly like martensite, but then the carbon escapes from the plate. Okay? So the growth of bainite is diffusion-less, but the carbon then escapes because we are operating at a high temperature. And these days, you are trying to do that with martensite in designing the quench and partitioning steels. So that's quite an important result. And from this result, we make many predictions, which we then have to verify experimentally. First of all, if um, since the reaction stops at T0, uh, and if, if my average carbon concentration is this, then when I get to this temperature, I will get zero bainite. Yeah? You know, once once the average carbon concentration of the steel is equal to T0, you cannot get bainite forming at all. Even though the temperature will be well below the equilibrium transformation temperature of austenite. So if you do dilatometry, this is uh, the Korean equivalent of centigrade. Okay. <laughs> um, if you do dilatometry, as you raise the transformation temperature, you get less and less bainite forming until eventually you get no bainite forming. And that's called the bainite start temperature. And it is always below the T0 temperature of the steel. Yeah? Because we've got strain energy to account for. And the amount of bainite also decreases as we raise the temperature because the composition of the austenite hits the T0 boundary sooner. So this, this is uh, called the incomplete reaction phenomenon because here there's plenty of driving force for austenite to transform to ferrite, but not for austenite to transform to ferrite without a composition change. Okay? So we've reached zero fraction of bainite even though we are well below the equilibrium temperature. That's why it's called incomplete reaction. It hasn't reached equilibrium and it won't do as long as the mechanism is bainite. The second, uh, so just to summarize, growth is diffusion-less, and of course, in making all these comparisons, we must take account of the strain energy due to the shape deformation, because that strain energy is quite large. The next prediction that you make is that if you measure the growth rate, then the growth rate must be much greater than consistent with the diffusion of carbon because martensite forms without diffusion, forms rapidly, right? Uh, how do we measure the growth rate? Because, you know, confocal microscopy is not good enough. Confocal laser microscopy, is, the resolution is uh, actually slightly worse than optical microscopy. So you're not going to be able to see the individual platelets growing. But there's a technique called photoemission electron microscopy, where you take a bulk sample and you excite electrons from that sample by shining light onto it. And then you use those electrons to form an image just like in a transmission microscope. Okay? But you can use a bulk sample at a high temperature. With that, the resolution is much higher. And I'm going to show you a sequence of four pictures. Uh, this is from a photo emission electron microscope. And you'll see individual platelets of bainite growing. Okay. So here, you are. can you see these ones? Yeah, those are individual platelets of bainite. And by looking at these images, we can calculate, uh, we can measure the growth rate. And it's about three orders of magnitude faster than would be permitted if we allowed carbon to diffuse during transformation. Okay. So that's consistent. So remember, whenever you have a theory, you have to be able to make predictions which you can validate experimentally. That's why, you know, nobody who works on string theory 
has won a Nobel Prize because they cannot make predictions which can be validated. Yeah. The observations have to be on the scale of 10 to the minus 34 meters to validate string theory. Okay, uh, can we uh, now explain this quantitatively? So all we have to do to predict the transition between upper and lower bainite is to compare the time for carbon to partition from the plate okay, with the time for precipitation. If, if this precipitation kinetics are rapid, then we will get lower bainite. If they are slow, then we will get upper bainite. So we put together a theory for the transition from upper to lower bainite. And it made predictions which I wasn't comfortable with. So this was my student, Manabu Takahashi. Uh, here we are plotting temperature versus carbon, and these are all calculations. Uh, this is the bainite start temperature and the martensite start temperature. And the strange thing is, if I look at a carbon concentration in this particular steel of less than 0.3, then as I lower the temperature, I go from upper bainite to martensite. There's no lower bainite. And you know, all the textbooks would have told you, including mine, that you get, you know, upper bainite, lower bainite, and then martensite. Here we are getting upper bainite directly to martensite. And as we go to these carbon concentrations, we go directly from lower bainite to martensite. There's no upper bainite. There's a narrow range of concentrations where you get all upper bainite, lower bainite, and then martensite. So we didn't publish this for quite a long time because we were not comfortable with the predictions until we discovered uh, papers in the literature. So this is uh, work done in Japan where they examined high carbon alloys. Okay? And you can see that in this case we go from perlite to upper bainite and then, uh, uh, sorry, perlite to lower bainite and then martensite. There's no upper bainite with the high carbon, okay? And then there's work by Omori and Honeycomb, which shows that with low, uh, with low carbon steels, you go directly from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. There's no lower bainite, okay? So it isn't true that in all steels, we will get upper bainite, lower bainite, and martensite. If you have a low carbon concentration, then the carbon can escape before precipitation can happen. Yeah, the driving force for precipitation is smaller when the carbon concentration is low. If you have a high carbon content, then it's easy to precipitate inside the ferrite and for some carbon to partition. So with low carbon steels, you may not actually get uh, any lower bainite. Okay, so there are many other predictions that we make which can be validated, and in the next lecture, we will use this theory in order to design some really nice steels, which are now commercial. Okay, so very, very simple calculation to dramatically change the toughness of the steel. Okay?